Greetings. So in your last individual session, you heard Jim talking about some of the basic ideas of model fitting. You've spent much of the previous day day talking about model worlds and your research questions. And we're going to continue moving towards bringing these together. I'm going to talk a little bit about how, a little bit more than Jim said about how we evaluate models. And we're moving towards bringing these ideas together for your final data research plans. So as I said, I'm talking about how we evaluate and compare models. And I'm going to do that by first talking about model types and model goals. The way we evaluate a model is going to depend on what we're trying to use the model for. I'm going to talk about what I feel is the really exciting idea of using model worlds and simulation to validate models and to validate specifically methods of fitting models. Because in a model world where you can do simulation, you can test your model fairly rigorously. I'm going to discuss ways that people evaluate fit. And as I promised early in the week, I'm going to talk about some of my concerns with the way the goodness of fit test is sometimes applied. And to do that, I'm going to take a digression and rant a little bit about statistical philosophy, since statistical philosophy and ranting are two of my favorite things. So your question as you're building a model or once you've built a model or once you've tried to fit a model is, do I have a good model? And that the way you approach that question is going to depend very much on what your model is trying to accomplish. And there's a wide range of things you might try to accomplish with any model or specifically with a dynamic model. One might be to generate hypotheses or to evaluate their plausibility. Do we understand, for example, um, threshold relationships? Um, another thing you might try to do with your model is prediction. Can we say with our model how many COVID cases we expect to see in the Western Cape in three weeks? Um, we may try to use our model to learn something to build the bridge between what's happening at the individual level and the population level to learn something about what's actually going on in our system. And we might build on that to ask, well, what might happen if things change or if we try to change things? So for example, we might ask if Montreal were to spend however many million dollars upgrading their influenza vaccination campaign, how many lives or how many work days might they expect to save? So I'm going to tell you a lot of things and I'm very opinionated, but what I don't want you to do is this. I'm going to tell you what to do and I sort of hope you're gonna do it, but I don't want you to do it because I say so. I want you to think about what I'm telling you. I want you to internalize some of these ideas and I want you to work towards or continue working towards building your own statistical philosophy. Statistics are a really important part of doing science and having your own statistical philosophy should be an important part of your scientific practice. So that's my introduction. And I'm gonna talk now about conceptual models and the kind of things we might be able to learn from models without even fitting them from data. So here's one of my favorite conceptual models. And I find this is a really useful conceptual model, both when it works and when it doesn't work. So this is the model that goes all the way back to Ronald Ross and says that if populations are mixing homogeneously, we expect to see this really sharp relationship between the proportion affected at equilibrium. Always remember this is an equilibrium picture and the population level factors underlying disease spread. And we've said that sometimes this model works really well, that it predicts a nonlinear effect, a virtuous cycle. If we reduce mosquito densities by a factor of four, we might reduce mosquito-borne disease burden by a much larger factor than that, or even eliminate it locally. So this model is great when it works, but it's also great when it doesn't work, because we know that we expect it to work 
when homogeneous mixing is a good assumption. And so when it doesn't work, as we saw, for example, in my heterogeneity lecture, we have some ideas of where to look and what kind of mechanisms to look for. Another conceptual model I really like involves clinical immunity in malaria. This is a picture made by my graduate student and also an ICI3D alum, Lindsay Keegan. And we worked on this project, but we did not have this original idea about the possible role of clinical immunity in malaria persistence. But the idea is a simple one, and it's one that's nicely tested by some simple conceptual models, which can also lay out um, what else we need to know to try to validate this idea in, in different scenarios. The basic idea is that people who live in malarious areas acquire what's called clinical immunity. They become infected with malaria, they can spread malaria, they can recover from their infections, but they don't get very sick and they don't seek treatment. And so the question is, under what circumstances might clinical immunity be particularly important in allowing malaria to persist in an area? And if clinical immunity and the fact that these people don't seek care has become key to malaria persistence in an area, then is it possible that we would reach a stage where unlike our normal endemic curve, where we have a single equilibrium for any given value, and if we were to say, intervene heavily against malaria, but then allow our basic reproductive number to go back up, we would find ourselves at the same equilibrium we were before. We might find ourselves in a situation where we have two different possible stable equilibria. So here we might have an equilibrium level of malaria that's maintained in part by clinically immune people not seeking care. And if we were to strongly intervene against malaria, reduce our population risk factors temporarily, malaria might tend not to come back. The level might fall. This represents the entomological inoculation rate. The level of malaria might fall. And by the time our campaign is relaxed, we might be in a regime where the disease can't reestablish itself, even though it could persist. So this is an idea that was pushed forward first by others and then by us with simple conceptual models. It's a way of evaluating plausibility. Another use of models that doesn't necessarily require statistical fitting is prediction. Um, and prediction can work pretty well, even in cases where you expect it wouldn't. So this is a picture of the final Ptolemaic model. The Ptolemaic model was a model of, that explained what we see in our sky in great detail and with beautiful theory, but based strongly on the obvious assumption that the Earth is the center of the universe and that the sun and the stars and the planets are orbiting around the Earth. So this became a tremendously complicated model. And what Copernicus said, well, if you try to do the same thing, but you put the sun in the center, then your model looks more like this. That was a revolution. And this is very convincing. And this model is better than this one in a lot of ways, but not in every way. Um, there's an interesting thing, which some of you may have noticed that's wrong with this model. When the Copernican model first came out and started a scientific revolution, the Ptolemaic model at that point in time remained better for predicting how the stars and planets were going to move around in our sky. Uh, so that's interesting. And depending on what your model, what you want your model to be good for, it doesn't always need to be mechanistically accurate. Another example of that. We talked earlier about cholera. Cholera, as Jim reminded me, is caused by bacteria and not just by bad water. Um, but the early models by far and others saying that cholera is caused by bad air and that we can predict where we'll find it by elevation were broadly useful pr for prediction. 
right? We see that the cholera mortality rate is very well predicted by elevation. And in fact, this is the simplest model that could help us predict that. So if we wanted to do interventions to palliate or to help um, treat people with cholera, this might be a very good model despite not being mechanistically accurate. The model of snow requires a lot more work and investigation and tracing. So for some purposes, it might not be as good. But if you really wanted to eliminate cholera, you would want to know the original cause. And this very detailed model would be better for that purpose. Now I want to go sort of jump to the idea of validating a model inside a model world. And I really like this idea. I really like the abstraction of model worlds. And I really like, we're now assuming that we want to do a statistical fit to a model. So we have data, we're fitting a model to it. We want to evaluate that fit or we want to infer parameters. The model world and the electronic computer are really powerful allies in this quest because we can build a model world and generate data. Doing simulations once you have a model world is quite simple. Fitting, constructing likelihoods, finding the best parameters can be very complicated. It can be very hard to know if your algorithm is right. But if you have a model world in simulations, you can test your fitting algorithm first in a case where you know the right answer. And we can make sure that our statistical method, that our approach to maximum likelihood and annealing and all the other complicated things that we may talk a little bit about in our next interactive session, we can test whether they work inside a model world with the right answer. So what kind of measures do we use to validate that? In my mind, the most important is statistical coverage. Um, and the others are less important. I've even put question marks next to two of them. I think your most important measure is statistical coverage. The next thing to evaluate a model by is precision. And I'll talk about why I don't think bias and accuracy are particularly important for evaluating a model fit, which does not mean that you're not worried about bias when you're thinking about constructing a model or when you're thinking about what to put into a model. It means that bias per se is not necessarily the best metric of what of whether you have a good model. And that's partly because coverage when done right is such a good metric. So what do I mean by coverage? Coverage is the statistical idea that a 95% confidence interval is really a 95% confidence interval and that you should be able to do statistical experiments to show that with your method, the right answer is inside your 95% confidence interval 95% of the time. That's the goal of statistics. That's what a 95% confidence interval should mean. And I would argue that if you're, the right answer is not inside the 95% confidence interval 95% of the time, your model is invalid. Here is an example of trying different statistical methods in a very real application. This is the example that Julie has already talked to you where some of us from ICI 3D were doing modeling to aid a decision about a clinical trial for Ebola vaccine. And we made some fairly complicated and I think very interesting simulation models inside our model world. And we asked if we construct a vaccination trial like this and do a statistical analysis like that, what proportion of the time do we get the right answer? And we found that with classic models like the Cox proportional hazards and the bootstrap, so the false positive rate here is the opposite of um, the opposite of the number of times, the opposite of coverage. Oh my God, my poor brain. The false positive rate here is the opposite of coverage. So with the Cox proportional hazard, um, under certain scenarios, we found 
that we were exceeding a 5% error rate, even though we constructed our model to have a 5% error rate. Um, and we found the similar problem with a naive bootstrap, but when we constructed a more careful permutation test, we found that all of our model, all of our models work quite well. Um, I like very often, and we'll come back to the, the, the talking about signs, meaning plus and minus in a slightly different context, but I like the idea of not just looking for a 5% total error rate, but that really in many cases, you wanna make sure you underestimate no more than two and a half percent of the time and overestimate also no more than two and a half percent of the time. So coverage for me is the gold standard of whether a statistical model is valid. And if you have good coverage and a sensible model, you're probably doing pretty well. The next criterion I would use to evaluate a model is precision. So a good model tries to provide a precise answer. The confidence intervals should be narrow if possible, but this is only useful if they're also valid, right? If we've already worried about coverage, um, as the data increases, your precision should increase. Um, and in theory, and in classic statistics, we often talk about the confidence intervals approaching zero width. In a real prob problem, you want to be very careful about that. Your confidence intervals should approach zero width only if you have a very large amount of data about everything that could possibly affect your conclusion. Don't make the mistake of building confidence intervals, but only considering one type of uncertainty. You can't obviously in the real world consider every possible type of uncertainty, but you should be thinking of building a realistic model world and including as much uncertainty as you feel you are practically able to do. Um, which I guess is what I just said here. Your CIs should be reflecting a variety of sources of uncertainty. What about bias and accuracy? If you have good coverage and high precision, by definition, you have accuracy, right? Accuracy is basically precision in the right place. It should also ensure low bias. Again, this doesn't mean we don't think about sources of bias when constructing a statistical method, but there's this idea that there's such a thing as an unbiased estimator, which is true, and that it's always best. And that's largely a red herring. I'll be happy to have debates if any of you is a committed statistical philosopher. But I'm just going to say estimators don't need to be absolutely unbiased. They just need to be eventually or asymptotically unbiased. And your good estimator that's passing these other tests is already asymptotically unbiased. So We've validated our model inside a model world. And I should say briefly that although I'm a big fan of simulation-based validation and it can help with almost any analysis, it's not always necessary. It can be onerous computationally. And if you're doing something that fits inside a well-validated classical statistical framework like linear regression as discussed by Jim, then model validation may not be necessary. Sorry, simulation-based validation may not be necessary. You do want to validate your model and be clear what model world you validated in. And then the next step is to evaluate your model by asking, does it match the real world? No, your model does not match the real world. No matter what model you have, no matter what question you have, the real world is more complicated. And so really what we wanna ask is how well does your model match the real world? And I'll come back to why I think this is an important distinction, but a point I can make now is that how well it matches the real world can depend in part on what you're trying to use it for. Does it match the real world well enough for a particular use? So one common method of evaluating model fits to the real world, which I think can be dangerous, is what's, what's called goodness of fit. So a goodness of fit statistic is something that describes how well a model prediction observe, matches observed data. 
and I have no objection to goodness of fit, fit statistics. My concern is with goodness of fit tests and with using goodness of fit tests in a hypothesis testing framework. So the question is, is the observed difference between your model and the data statistically significant? And I'm gonna argue that that's always the wrong question, virtually always the wrong question. Your model is false or at least incomplete, but what it isn't is a true model of the data that you've observed in the real world. And a goodness of fit test is not gonna make your model the true model, but that's what the goodness of fit test is nominally testing. The question of, can I tell whether your model is the true model or not? And the answer is yes, I can tell whether your model is the true model or not because it's not. So how do models pass goodness of fit tests? Well, sometimes models pass goodness of fit tests by being very good models, by being close to reality, even though they're not exactly reality, and that's fine. But that's not by any means the only way to pass a goodness of fit test. Models that make very broad predictions or data that are sloppily collected and are easily consistent with a wide variety of models can also cause your goodness of fit test to be passed, which means you find no significant difference. You think you find no significant difference between your model and the data. So why would we do a goodness of fit test? Well, I'm already accidentally implying that we shouldn't, but to unravel this, I wanna take the digression into why do we use p-values in biology? Because I'm going to claim that the same problem at least seems to occur whenever we use p-value. So what's the problem? I can make any model pass a goodness of fit test by broadening the uncertainty. That doesn't make it a good model. So how does this tie into the world of p-values? So here's an example that I love to think about. It's a real experiment but I feel that the story I tell about the experiment has gotten pretty far away from how the real experiment was done. And I can guarantee you that none of the data I show you from the experiment are real. Um, but people wanted to know if vitamin A supplements would improve the health of village children. And they looked at different outcomes, including how quickly the children with and without vitamin A are growing. And you could ask, well, what does it mean if I find a significant p-value for some effect in this experiment? And it's a little frustrating to me that I can't do this as dialogue-y as I want to. Um, and I'm going to ask you to take a break now. Hit pause. Sorry. Hit pause. Think about what your answer to this question would be. And I want you to take a break now. I meant to ask you to take a break earlier, so this works well. In a second, I'm going to ask you to hit pause and think about what it might mean if you do, or for that matter, don't find a significant p-value for the outcome of height growth in six months. So the standard answer is that I forgot to tell you to hit pause. That seems to be right and I'm not happy now. Um, So what does it mean if I find a significant p-value for some effect in this experiment? This, it's really frustrating to me. I'd really like to be able to engage with you about the answer. Um, since we can't, what I'm going to do is ask you in a minute, in one minute to take a break. I forgot to ask you to take a break earlier, so this might work out well. <sighs> 
but I want you to get up, stretch all with the computer paused, and then come back, think about this question, think about how you would answer the question if I pointed at you and force you to answer. If I study the outcome of height growth and I find that the p-value is significant, what would I conclude? Okay, pause now. Okay, welcome back. I didn't have to pause, you had to pause, hopefully you did it. Um, the standard answer, which I usually get from a class, is that if the p-value is significant, that means the difference between the vitamin A supplemented children and the placebo children is unlikely to be due to chance. And my answer to that is, so what? Of course it's not due to chance. Vitamin A is called vitamin A for a reason. It has strong effects on people's metabolisms. I do not ever expect the only difference between the vitamin A children and the control children to be due to chance. So why would I wanna ask whether something that I already know is impossible is in addition unlikely? Why do I wanna know the p-value anyway? So to think about that, I'm gonna look at some completely false um, results from this study. So we studied the proportional increase in three other quantities. I'm not sure what happened to height here. Um, and we can say, well, the children who had <clears throat> the supplements, they grew in weight a little more than 1% faster than the other children. They grew in the measure of fat fold of wh whether they have sufficient fat, even a little faster than that. Um, and they also had a very small and possibly metabolically insignificant increase in their iron levels. And we could ask, well, which of these three values might be biologically significant, which would require a deeper look into the biology of the question. But we could also ask which of these three values we might think are statistically significant. And we could ask whether those look to us like the same question in this case. So pausing again, make sure you have your answer clear in your mind, hit the pause button if you need to, but the p-values for these data are as follows. It's the iron, which may be the biologically least significant one, which is statistically the most significant one. And many of you figured that out, I know from experience, and you figured out that iron is the one that's statistically significant because it doesn't include zero, which seems like it may answer the question or may not. Again, we're completely confident that vitamin A is changing lots of things. We're giving it in metabolically significant doses. The differences aren't purely random. What is the interesting thing about this not including a value which we basically know is impossible anyway? The answer is, and feel free to pause again and see what answer you would give. The answer is that by not including zero, this confidence interval also doesn't include any negative values. A confidence interval that doesn't include zero means not only that we're confident that there's some effect, it means we're confident that we know the sign of the effect. Um, and here's something that we can try to discuss when we meet, you know, if you wanna, this is leftover from when I used to discuss this in person before giving the answer, but we could discuss. Do you agree that biologists basically do and should assume that an answer to a sense, our sensible question is not exactly zero? And I'll say, even if you don't agree, you might go along with my philosophy because maybe you would agree that even if an effect can be zero, we can't use statistics or biological measurements to prove that an effect is zero. The effect could always be there, but smaller than we're able to see. For example, the effects that we now see um, with codon adaptation and that two genomes that code for exactly the same proteins might nonetheless have tiny measurable differences between them. Um, and then we can ask, well, if we make the assumption that the null hypothesis is false, 
why might we want a p-value anyway? And my answer to that is going to be what I said, which is that the thing with the significant p-value is the thing that we're confident about the sign. We use the difference from zero in simple cases as a proxy for whether we're confident about sign. Here's another example and one which I really like and one that sheds a lot of light on the danger of using p-values wrong. And this was me. This is a paper that I got accepted to the American Journal of Epidemiology and almost got published with this horrendous logical error in it if I hadn't been saved by a reviewer. Um, so what we did is we studied deaths caused by influenza in the United States. Um, this was over a decade ago, and we were the first people, I think, to do it right, because the statistical methods, influenza is highly conflated with seasonal fluctuations, and the statistical methods that people use to try to disentangle why people are dying more in February than they are in August are highly conflated. And what we did is we just tried to construct a measure that was annualized. How many extra people die each year and how does that correlate with virological me measures? And what we found is a statistically significant effect of influenza A and one for influenza B that turned out to be very consistent with the estimates people were making with statistical methods that we didn't think were very good. But we also did a regional study where we looked at cold and we said, are people dying more when it's cold? And what we found is, no, we found that the p-value is not significant, which is often interpreted to mean incorrectly, to mean that there's no effect. Um, and not only that, it's, it's all very smooth, right? The weather has a very high p-value and a very small estimate. And we said in the paper, in our discussion, well, why did we not find this effect that we suspected? Why is weather not causing deaths at the annualized time scale when we know that people die when the weather is colder? And we hypothesized that most of the people who die when the weather is colder would have died anyway inside a time window and therefore not affect the deaths at the time scale of a year. And it all sounded very plausible and my co-authors liked it and some of the reviewers liked it. All the reviewers kind of liked it, but one of the reviewers said, why are you not showing us confidence intervals? So we added the confidence intervals and what do you think the confidence intervals here look like? And it's very counterintuitive. I know that in my training, I would have said, well, this blue dot is a small effect and it's correlated with a large p-value, which should, makes me feel even more like it's unimportant. And that's exactly wrong. Once I know how big this effect is, and then my estimate of the effect is actually fairly small, information about the p-value being big should only make me nervous, should only make me feel like the confidence interval is large. And that's what it is. In fact, for whatever reason, in this study where we calculated all these estimates from the same model, for some very difficult to understand reason, our estimate of the effect of weather is very uncertain. And not only can't we say that weather is not an important killer of people at the annualized time scale, we can't even say it's not the most important killer of people of our three causes in the annualized time scale. All we can say is that we can't be sure whether more people die on average in cold winters or hot winters. We don't know why we're so uncertain about the weather. So we learned some lessons here, right? One is always look at the confidence intervals. One is don't do this thing where you think that a high p-value is telling you something. All a high p-value is telling you is that you haven't seen something clear. So in particular, we're never gonna say that A is significant and B isn't, and therefore this effect 
is more important than that effect. If you want to know whether this effect is more important than that effect, you must compare them directly. Sometimes this is difficult. One of the reasons that people often use lazy and correct statistics is that it's easier to do than constructing the test that you want. To summarize, or the metaphor I use, low p-values are sometimes useful. A low p-value tells you you've seen something clearly. High p-values are almost never useful, possibly never. All a high p-value tells you is that you haven't seen something clearly. You've seen something unclearly. Low p-values can be useful. Say, I'm confident there's an effect there and I want to probe at it more. But it's usually better to focus on what you see than the p-value. And people very often don't do that. We attach a certain level of magic to p-values in our scientific culture. But you should never base a conclusion on a high p-value. Literally never. If I have a high p-value, there's something I don't see clearly. It may be because the effect is small, but the high p-value should not be used to advance your conclusion. There will be a better piece of evidence to advance your conclusion. Going back to the goodness of fit test, your model is not reality. You already know the null hypothesis is false. So all the goodness of fit test is telling you is whether you can see the difference clearly. If you can't, if you can't clearly see the difference between your model and the data, your model may be good or it may be bad, but we probably can't add any more complexity to the model based on the current data because there's nothing left in the current data for us to reliably explain. Similarly, if yes, the model may be good or bad, but it's possible if we see the difference clearly, then it means that there might be things in the data still left for us to explain. But we may not need to. There may be a model that's perfectly good, that fits all the characteristics of the data that we need to, or that allows us to answer our question, but we can still see the fact that the data differ from the model, because we know the data are going to differ from the model, because we know that the model is working in a model world and not in the real world. Um, yeah, I have no idea why it says reward and punishment. I added it, I think, for day 2019. So maybe it was apropos to that, or maybe somebody who was at day 2019 can remind me. So we might get a p-value for a goodness of fit test, and it might have some meaning, but typically we don't need to. We look at our model and we ask, did it do what we needed? Did it capture the patterns we're looking for? Does it seem to capture the characteristics of the data that an expert thinks are important or that may be important for answering a specific question? Um, using a goodness of fit statistic, as I said, can be a good guide to how well your model fits the data compared to other models, but I would be very, wary of using the p-value. We can go beyond how our model fits the data, and there are a lot of techniques for that, I guess a little beyond the scope of this lecture, but the key question is, does your model make predictions outside the range on which you calibrated it? And we can do this by coming up with a new problem, or we can do it by packaging up our calibration method and trying it on subsets of the data. So the famous example of outside range predictions is the dramatic demonstration of Einstein's theory of general relativity. He used measurements of short periods of time in laboratories based on Earth to predict that stars were going to look like they shifted during solar eclipses. That was very convincing. As biologists, we don't have anything that dramatic. But for example, people might calibrate a, a cholera model in Haiti and use it to predict a cholera outbreak somewhere else. People are routinely predicting influenza patterns in the future 
from models they, pre they calibrate in the past and predicting sometimes with a fair amount of accuracy, the severity of influenza seasons in different places before they happen. Um, here's a dramatic example of a way out of sample prediction. And I'm happy to talk if we have time about A, what is this a picture of in general? And B, why it's such a dramatic example of out of sample predictions. I also referred to packaging up your calibration system and testing it. And we do this with something called test sets. The idea of a test set is that you either really or through packaging and repeating fit a model to data while keeping some of it out. And then you can look and see how well does your model fit to data that you didn't use while you were fitting the model. Um, and I think this is the kind of thing that people should probably do more. And I'm actually working with an ICI 3D alum and a SESIMA alum, Steve Sigu, right now to work on various test set, training set based methods, uh, not that we're the only ones doing it at all. Another technique I really like is to make a series of model worlds. If you're gonna fit a statistical dynamical model to a model world, and you've seen some of this from Jim's explanations, your model world is probably really simple and your model is really simple but you can simulate a very complicated model. And you can ask, since when you simulate a complicated model, you still know the answers, right? And so you can ask, how well does the simple model world and my model constructed inside the simple model world do at predicting a complicated model world? I'm also curious how many people know why this image is my representation of a model world. This is yet another question we can get to if we have time. It's the kind of thing that's fun to do in the classroom. Um, and you can use nested model worlds to ask what details need to be in your model world to make a prediction. And people do this. So right after the West African Ebola outbreak, the NIH had a challenge where they used extremely complicated model worlds and extremely complicated simulations for different scenarios of Ebola-like outbreaks and various teams, including one that I was part of, then tried to fit these complicated models using much simpler models that we were able to fit and see what could we learn from that exercise and what details retrospectively might be more important going forward. So here's a short-term forecast that we made and we see that um, I think these are 90% confidence intervals and we made the forecast at this point in time and we almost missed, but not quite. Um, and here's the longer term forecast from the same point. And this illustrates some of the points that I'm making about propagating error. We tried to do a realistic job propagating error and did a better job, I think, with coverage than most of the other teams in the challenge. Um, we didn't do better than average at actually guessing values, but you can see here why confidence intervals are very often too narrow in published papers is because if you realistically propagate a number of sources of uncertainty in a lot of real situations, what you wind up with are very, very wide confidence intervals. So here we said we're pretty confident that there's going to be between 1,000 and 500,000 Ebola cases before the epidemic peters out. This is a fictional world, and we had no hesitation saying that. But in the real COVID world, you get a lot of pushback from people who you're consulting with if your confidence intervals are wide. Um, also from the West African Ebola outbreak comes an example of simple conceptual models being used to generate hypotheses. In this case, cert certain features of the data made some of us think that transmission during burial might be dynamically important. And when I say 
some of us thought that that was arising from the observation in the field that transmission can happen during burial. And so we were able to test the plausibility that safe burial teams might be helpful in the Ebola outbreak. Um, similarly, this is a project I really like and that Julie may be slightly involved in, um, where some collaborators measured patterns of transmission between species in strains of canine rabies in Tanzania. And we generated the hypothesis that really domestic dogs were driving all of these trains of, chains of transmission. And the hypothesis was then that aggressive vaccination of domestic dogs could eliminate rabies from many areas of the world or eliminate canine strains of rabies, which are the ones that kill almost all the people, have almost all the human health burden. And that seems to have been a true hypothesis, um, which we helped generate with a very simple model. Um, Farr had a hypothesis that cholera was spread by something carried in air. Snow had a hypothesis that cholera was spread by something carried in water. And these are testable hypotheses generated by models, in this case, conceptual models. And Snow famously tested his hypothesis by illegally removing the handle from a pump that he thought was a focus of a cholera epidemic. And he turned out to be right. So I know I've asked more questions than I've provided you with answers. I'm hoping to convince you that thinking about questions like this needs to be an important part of your scientific practice. So in summary, dynamic models have a wide variety of uses. We use them to clarify thinking. What are our assumptions? What else do we need to know? Um, they help us understand outcomes. We can ask simple questions like, is heterogeneity in human sexual behavior enough to explain the first 15 years of the HIV outbreak in Southern Africa? Or is it possible that aggressive uh, random drug treatment against malaria, which sounds like it might be a silly idea, in some places might actually break the cycle of malaria treatment so that people will start getting mildly or moderately ill, seeking treatment, and therefore not allowing malaria to have an R naught of one. We use dynamic models to predict very specific outcomes. Um, are we gonna have an outbreak of a particular disease in a particular place? When is COVID going to get under control? What might it take to bring HIV down and eventually eliminate HIV? And we can use dynamical models to find new mechanisms. The importance of sexual mixing heterogeneity in sustaining sexually transmitted disease was at first conceptualized many decades ago in part through models. Similarly, the nonlinear response in some cases of disease burden to mosquito control. Um, to evaluate when at all possible, we first want to construct a careful model world and make sure our model is working as we think inside the model world. Um, we can then, we can also inspect our model results. How do they compare to work um, results from the real world? What can we infer? What can we predict? And can we use models to generate and test mechanistic hypotheses. So I'm going to try to wrap up partly for time, and I hope that we'll be able to have a nice conversation about this when next